We welcome you all here to our worship service this morning here in the sanctuary. We welcome those of you who are joining on Zoom and those of you who are also joining by phone. Our family is um, happy to be here with you today and, and um, hoping to lead you in worship. Uh, we've been up in the balcony for many Sundays, so it's very nice to have this perspective and see your eyes and your smiling faces. Um, so last week, our Advent focus, Advent focus was um, daring us to imagine God's goodness. And today, we will continue to imagine and imagine God's warm embrace. So imagining the wideness of God's embrace of all the creatures in creation, it will widen our hearts this morning to do things that make room for peace. Uh, we'll start this morning with some announcements to embrace our church life together. And you can see some on the screen. Uh, this week, uh, on Tuesday the 7th, the Mennonite women will meet in the fellowship hall, and there's information in the bulletin about that. Ed Yoder has a special 90th birthday coming up next Sunday, so be sure to check the bulletin for his address. There's a card shower that's being organized for him. And then uh, next Sunday on December 12th, the Hillcrest Academy Christmas concert will be taking place at three o'clock and it will be uh, a, a great event to celebrate the uh, holiday season. There also will be a Christmas party for fifth through eighth graders following that Christmas concert. Um, and then today for second hour for Sunday school, the adults can meet with our age-like groups and the children will meet in the choir room first. And then I hear there's some practice to be taking place here in the sanctuary. Uh, children, also as you're coming in today and in the weeks to come, be thinking about the wise men from the nativity scene in the back. Word is, is that they're traveling around every Sunday. So when you come, you can look for them and find out where they are around the church. So there's many other announcements in the bulletin, um, but we'll open it up now for announcements in the sanctuary. Doug will bring the mic around. This is Anna Yoder. I don't know this, I'm praying it, but I think Ed, is, Ed will be coming home tomorrow from the nursing home. So I'm just so happy for that. He's ready to come home. Everything went well at the doctor's on Thursday. So thank you for praying for us and for healing. Thank you. And now we'll move into our time of worship this morning. In the quietness of our winter season, God breathes. God comes close, open-armed. We are held tightly, gently, tenderly. God's embrace is wide. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and God pulls the cries close. God is already here. And now Warren will come up to lead us in a song, and Lucas will light the Advent candle. Good morning. Our first song will be number 211 in the Voices Together. It's also number 15 in Sing the Story. Hope is a candle. Verna will play through uh, the song once on piano, and then we'll sing verses 1 and 2. Thank you. 
So Ethan and I will uh, are going to lead you in our candle litany today. So I will be, read the part of the leader, and you all will follow along with Ethan as the people. We light a candle of peace, and we imagine a tender mercy, God's compassion. We light the candle of peace to feel God's embrace, God's nearness, God's breath. Imagine that we are God's wonders, blessed wonders. And at this time, Warren is going to lead us in our opening songs. All right, let's stand and turn in voices together, number 217. Number 217, hark the glad sound.
For our time of confession today, we invite you, if you're able to kneel, or you can imagine the posture of kneeling and how that feels during our time of confession today. God, we begin these moments of confession by imagining your beauty and goodness. In silence, we ask you to hold us in peace. <clears throat> Held in your strength, we give to you the noise, the conflict and the irritations that occupy us and zap us of the energy we need for other thoughts and tasks. Confident because your arms hold us close, we dare to imagine freedom from sin. We are ready to step into the crooked and uneven world that we live, knowing that your hand will guide us. So at this time, I invite you to now imagine the support of God's hands as you rise to your feet, physically or in spirit, Hear now God's words, <clears throat> excuse me, of assurance and peace. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us and give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Luke 1, 78, 79. All right, at this time, uh, just like to bring folks' attention, a um, number of different ways that you, anyone can give financially to the work of the church. In the back of the sanctuary, there's an offering basket um, that you may uh, place anything in, an envelope or, a, or, or money donation on your way out. Uh, you may also mail things into the church. You may give online through the online tab of our guidance or of our website. Sorry, my guidance counselor, that comes out of my mouth a lot. Um, and you may also give through the Vanco mobile app. At this time, we are going to have a prayer for today's offering. Please bow your heads. God of great wonders, we join with you in the joy of this season of giving. You gave us a savior who is Christ the Lord. You give us life and breath. You fill the world with beauty, our hands with bounty, and our hearts with the desire to give. Accept these gifts and ourselves and serve us always, in every season. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite the children forward for children's time, uh, being led by Marvin Betsy. Thank you. All right, good morning. You remembered to put on your robes so that we can imagine the story today. So everybody get on their robes, find a spot to sit, calm yourself down <laughs> so you can hear the story. Does anybody here know what the word shalom means? How about the word peace? Do you know what the word peace means? Anybody? 
<laughs> okay, well, shalom is kind of like peace. And peace is like, if you're arguing in, in your house, it's not peaceful in your house, is it? Peace is like quiet and getting along. So um, today we're talking about peace. And it's the word shalom is a little more than peace. It's like wholeness and harmony and community. Think of it as God's embrace. You know what an embrace is? It's like a hug. God's embrace or God's hug. When Jesus was born, I'm actually going to take this off quick. <laughs> when Jesus was born, people were hopeful for the shalom of the past, present, and future. This helpless little baby was going to play an important role in what God was up to. Dare to imagine God's peaceful embrace. Okay, I want to show you something. Let's just move this over here. Do you know what this is? It's a pretzel. Can you make your arms look like a pretzel right now? Can you give yourself a hug? Does that remind you of a pretzel? No. <laughs> All right, this shape with your arms wrapped around you is an old prayer pose. And that is kind of like a self hug. And it helps us to remember God's love when we pray this way. Let's imagine again, imagine God's love for all people is a great big enormous hug. This hug includes all people of every color, shape, size, outgoing, shy, loud, quiet, funny, serious. It includes everyone. Okay, for our ending, you remember last week we handed out a color sheet and crayons. We're going to pass that out again at the end, and you can put your crayons at the back of the church when you're done before you go to Sunday school. Okay, so for this last part, I'm going to ask you to stand up and give yourself a hug. I'm going to ask three of these older kids to give me a hand. One, two, three. Can you guys give me a hand? Okay, we're going to make a circle around the kids for prayer. So I want you to hold this end. I want you to hold this end. Okay, ready? We're going to say a prayer now. So I want you to give yourselves a pretzel hug. Can you give yourself a pretzel hug? And then be real quiet because we're going to pray, okay? Dear God, we are so grateful for Shalom, God's peace. We thank you for each child here today and ask that you feel that they feel your embrace surrounding them right now. Help them to remember this symbol every time they see a pretzel and to remember how you love them. Okay, you can put your robes in the box and you can get some pretzels and a coloring sheet.
today's scripture reading is from Philippians 1, verse 3 through 11. I will be reading from the NIV version. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ, through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. I now invite Joni Miller up for today's sermon. I know, sorry about that, but I'm still going to try to pull it down a little bit because I can't see you without. I talked to Carrie about trying to find a step stool to stand on, but here I am. So if I asked you this morning if you were more of a thinking or a feeling person, which way do you think you would lean? Think about how you make decisions. A thinking person puts more weight on objective principles and impersonal facts. A feeling person puts more weight on personal concerns and the people involved. So think about it. When you're making a decision, do you typically analyze the pros and cons, make your list? Or do you make your decision by weighing what people care about and the point of view of the persons involved? Both of us are, both of us, most of us are both of these. We're on that spectrum somewhere in there. We're not typically at one end or the other. Whether we're, we lean towards one or the other often depends on the time and the situation. So much depends on time and the situation, doesn't it? For example, we lit the traditional candle of peace this morning for the second Sunday of Advent. What is your context for peace today? Does it relate to COVID? Does it relate to family and friend relationships? Does it, when you think about peace, um, make you think about your financial situation or work? You've likely sat in these exact pews or other pews for many, many years and have sat through the second Sunday of Advent often over those years, that lighting of the peace Think back over the decades. What did lighting the peace candle mean back in the 60s, for those of you that can think to that time, or the 80s, or even just a few years ago? Today, in this time and place, we are challenged by the curriculum that we're following this morning to imagine God's embrace. How do you experience that today? Let's go back for a moment to that question. Do you tend to think or go by feeling more? On the Saturday morning news yesterday, they did a story, a study on, um, because of the pandemic and us being distant from each other, they did a study on physical contact and hugs. And they checked to see if two strangers embraced, what was the length of time that felt the best to those two strangers? And they had three different categories. And the first two were short, and they put this longer one of 10 seconds, thinking nobody would want to be in embrace with 10 seconds with a stranger. But what they found is that people found the most enjoyment in the 10 second hug. Just think for a moment of why that would be. And for a moment, could you let go of your thinking enough to feel with me and really imagine God's embrace. When I did this myself, 
tried to think of God's embrace, the first thing that came to my mind was a Morgan hug. A lot of you have met our daughter Morgan. She's 32 in chronological years, but if you've met her, you know that she's more like three to five in her ability to think in academic kinds of ways, you know, math, reading, those types of things. But at the exact same time, she is so, so uh, far in age when it comes to having the insight to live in peace deep in here when there is a lot of chaos going on in the surface of her life. And what Morgan can do is she knows how to love and she knows how to offer that in an embrace. She gives the best hugs ever. When she gives you a real hug, it makes me think of melting like butter. Her body with that, she has um, just enough softness, plumpness to her that when she engulfs you in her hug, it is just um, pure comfort. It's a place I love to be with our arms wrapped around each other, melting into the plumpness. It's a hug that um, is not obligatory. That's not Morgan. She doesn't do things that she doesn't want to. It is that old soul within her letting go of the world and simply and fully being present in that moment, feeling, giving, and taking a real embrace. Have you felt that? Have you felt the difference between a hug and an embrace? Can you imagine that with God? You heard this morning when the Yoders read from the book of Philippians earlier, how is it that today that scripture can provide something to us in the context of this time and place? Well, to answer that, I uh, asked Joel for some commentaries and he gave me three. One of them was this thick. <laughs> I am not um, a biblical scholar. I've not gone to seminary, but I decided to go ahead and study it and then came to a message that I felt I needed to share that's really rather simple. But just for background on the scripture, this is Paul writing a letter and it's not his only writing that's um, in scripture. This was what he has several letters that are um, books in the New Testament. Remember that he started out as a Jewish man named Saul who was going, and he was mean to the early church. He persecuted the early church. And then when he was on the Damascus Road, he had a vision, and he felt like he was um, seeing the living Jesus Christ. And it changed who he was enough that he literally changed his name from Saul to Paul and began dedicating his life to serving Christ. Well, as it turns out, that was not an easy life based on, as he was doing this, going about preaching and teaching and introducing Christ to people, he felt the Holy Spirit guiding him and traveled farther west to an agricultural center near a fertile plain where grain and wine was produced. And he established a church there. This church was supporting him financially and through prayer, despite being poor. This church loved him and he loved them, but he wasn't able to be with them. He was writing a letter because he was in jail. One of their members was delivering this letter to them. And so his context in that time and place was to write in a way that would express what he wanted to have expressed, but at the same time, not get this person who was carrying the letter back and forth um, into any kind of trouble to avoid any negative outcomes if that letter was intercepted. When Paul was writing this letter to this church, the Philippians, I can't imagine that he was thinking that his words would be translated and interpreted for centuries to come after that. He was just simply writing to a group of people he loved and wanted to offer thanks and assurance. 
Now, this is Paul's second time in jail. At one point in what we were reading, it talked about chains even. He was truly being persecuted as a follower of Christ. Life was hard for him. And in fact, it had to feel dark, heavy, painful, difficult, hopeless. We could go on adding words to that, couldn't we? So when I imagine him being in scripture, I think about if he was Jewish, he could probably have had some of the ancient scripts with him that he would have, been, would have felt familiar to him, that he might have referred to. And I imagine him going back to the prophet Isaiah's words. So from Isaiah 43, he wrote, <clears throat> Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. And maybe that type of sentiment, that promise he could have been holding on to, might have allowed what the commentaries agree on. And that is that his letter to the Philippians, despite this dark place, was full of joy and love. So how can that happen? Does this take someone so special that a letter they wrote would be included in a collection of writing that has guided the faith of millions over centuries? My context and my feeling and thought today, and what I felt I needed to share with you today is that Paul was as human as each of us are in this place today. Yet he stepped into the water and the fire with trust. I imagine it feeling hard to keep his head above the water and his head above the water. And I imagine his heart within that jail cell that even in the darkness, he must have dared to imagine God's embrace. Let's hear what he said from a different translation. This is it from the messenger. Um, in the messenger, Philippians 1, 3 to 11, it's titled, A Love That Will Grow. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that you have continued on with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. It's not at all fanciful for me to think this way about you. My prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put on trial, and came out in one piece. All along, you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love and miss you these days. Sometimes, I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not just sentimental gush. Live a lover's life circumspect and exemplary, a life Christ Jesus would be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. When I read this, I was reminded of traveling through Muscatine a while back and reading a banner that was on the outside of a church. The message was very big and very simple, and it truly stuck with me. I think that's what made it so powerful. It simply said, live to love. What would it look like if we did this? What would it take to be able to do this? 
Is that not the example we have of Paul? Not just in this letter he wrote to one church, but the many letters, along with the essence of the other books and letters and words that we have from over time. The message is quite simple when we step back and let ourselves exist in faith. And that is what that God, and that is that God is love and our greatest command is to love. Are we not to live to love? Love not in sentimental ways of the world. In one of Joel's commentaries, Craddock, I think his name would be pronounced, um, wrote, not a love that is sentimental and easy and grins at the wrong time. I think he had been reading, watching Hallmark movies <laughs> when he wrote this. <laughs> not a love that is sentimental, easy, and grins at the wrong time. Not a love that shrinks from truth-telling and tough engagements, but a love that is joined to knowing and understanding, to probing and discerning, to put itself to the test in real life situations and making moral choices in matters that count. So love not out of obligation, but within that all consuming embrace of our God of love. I wanna remind you that even if you have not had a dramatic Damascus Road experience, the same Lord that reached out to Saul is also available to us today. He is a living God. So in the context of today, is there a Damascus road before you? Are you open to seeing it? What is God's message for you today? In our confession that the Yoders also read for us, we heard these words, I wanna remind you of them. Confident because your arms hold us close we dare to imagine freedom from sin. We are ready to step into the crooked and uneven world in which we live, knowing your hand will guide us. Freedom from sin. Paul's prayer for the Philippines, Philippines, Philippians, in some translations was that they would be judged blameless. That we know as humans that we are imperfect and we cannot be sinless but he uses blameless, that's freedom from sin. That is about repentance. It's about turning and turning again and learning and turning and learning and continually moving towards love. I have an example of that type of love to share with you. Carrie and I have a um, good friend, very, very long, long time friend for Carrie. And he has lived in various parts of the country working for a foundation, a national level foundation, whose mission is to develop a brighter future for children and youth at risk of poor educational, economic, social, and health outcomes. So he has specifically focused on advocating at the federal level for foster children. So he spends time in DC trying to influence the laws and the decisions around funding and all of that kind of thing that would go towards that. He happens to be in a long-term relationship with a woman of color. So that's the context of this. Um, his mom lives across the country from him and she is in the advanced stages of dementia and needs help. And her husband, um, our friend's stepdad, isn't capable of doing that on his own so our friend picked up everything and moved to be with his mom and her husband to help care for him, care for them. This is a beautiful example of love right there, but it's not why I chose this story and this example of this as this as an example of this type of love. It is because his mom's husband is very a very outspoken and opinionated man and his political and social beliefs are the opposite of our friends. He is a good man, but he has no hesitation in expressing what we would see as racist comments. 
This is not the subtle background sort of differences, but the constant TV presence, most conversation sort of level of difference. And yet, this is what our friend said when he was describing living there with his mom and stepdad. He said, my job is to love mom, and that means loving him too. So I focus on that, just loving them. That is not obligation. That is living to love. The love of Christ is not a love that waits for something to happen and then to respond. This love is an initiating love. It doesn't hold back, even when the other person makes it very hard to love or when the situation is dark. This kind of love reaches out and melts into us in a plump embrace focused on that very moment. It reaches out, but do we accept? Do we allow ourselves to feel that difference between a simple obligatory hug and a true loving embrace? His embrace does not save us from pain. We all know that we are here in this crooked and uneven world. But I remind you of the words of Isaiah. When he talked, he talked about not if you go through the water, but when you go through the water. We know we will. Accepting and feeling God's embrace, it begins here with each other and loving right here today. Advent prepares us for Christmas, but Advent is not just about the birth of the baby, but the day of Christ yet coming. Paul reminds these people he loves to prepare for that. So within the week ahead, we have today lit the candle of peace. Let us think about God's embrace. Let us think and allow ourselves to feel that embrace, for we are loved. Let us offer his embrace, for not only are we his, but he is ours. Let us keep turning and turning and learning. Let us balance our thinking and our feeling this week so that we can be open to our loving God. Where is God calling you and taking you? I'd like to end by going back to a portion of Paul's letter one more time and pray for us what Paul prayed for these people he loved. This time the version I'm using is the Jerusalem Bible. You know, we began talking about the feeling, thinking, and you might note that Paul prayed that they both um, improve their thinking and deepen their feeling. So pray with me. My prayer is that your love for each other may increase more and more and never stop improving your knowledge and deepening your perception so that you can always recognize what is best. This will help you to become pure and blameless and prepare you for the day of Christ when you will reach the perfect goodness which Christ Jesus produces in us for the glory and praise of God. Amen.
Thank you to Sean for putting that together this morning. That was beautiful. So for our benediction today, it seemed appropriate that we don't just end with a simple sending words from the pulpit, but for you to offer your own sort of embrace to each other. So it's suggested that you turn to each other and offer the peace of Christ. So the peace of Christ be with you. If you could rise and say that to each other as you exit. Thanks for coming today. Peace be with you.